Hello, today my presentation is on the lifetime management of aortic valve disease. And thank you very much for the honor of presenting at your meeting. Here are my disclosures. Well, the treatment of valve disease is now evolving. Patients getting older, they're getting more complex. Medical therapy has also advanced during the time frame, as well as surgery now is safer and better in terms of developing better expertise and found they are now emerging less invasive alternatives. Here's a picture of the aortic stenosis that you see in the operating room. You can see this highly calcified trileaflet valve. And in the United States, you can see that TAVR has now exceeded all surgical aortic valve replacement volume since 2019. And you can see that it includes not just isolated AVR, but also combined surgeries or root replacements. At the same time, TAVR patients are getting younger. In low risk patients, they're now 75 in 2020 in the United States. And guidelines have also changed. You can now see that in the US, TAVR is now indicated in patients 65 or older. In Europe, they prefer in patients 75 or older. And they're also indicated across all surgical risk categories. How we stratify risk, it depends on the patient, their age, their medical issues, and also any difference in functional status. So why is TAVA preferred over SAVR? Well, obviously it's less invasive. There's no high long machine involved. Patient typically goes home in 24 to 40 hours. Faster recovery within one week, they're back on their feet doing whatever they need to. And the data speak for themselves. There are no differences versus high risk at five years, intermediate risk at five years, and now low risk at least two years. Now there are some exclusion criteria in the randomized control trials for the FDA approval for TAVR in low-risk patients, you can see them here, such as bicuspid, severe calcification, concomitant disease, severe coronary disease, poor ejection fraction, et cetera. But there are some trade-offs between SAVR and TAVR. There's less parabolic leak and less conduction abnormalities with SAVR, but there's less AFib bleeding, acute renal injury in TAVR. Hospital stay and time recovery is completely shorter with TAVR but the durability, at least for SAVR, is pretty well known. TAVR, it's about eight years. And coronary access can be challenging with TAVR over SAVR. Here are the current generation TAVR devices that are approved. The balloon expandable on the left side, Sapien 3 Ultra, and now soon Sapien X4. And the self-expanding model with the Evo FX, Acura Neo2, and Navator. So these are the five points I look at when evaluating a patient young low-risk patient for salver versus TAVR. Can they be done transfemoral? Can we achieve a surgical-like result similar to surgery? Is parabolic acceptable? What about conduction system issues? Are they benign? Quality access after TAVR can be challenging. And finally, lifetime management of these patients. You know, what to do with the aortic valve disease that now after TAVR and also coronary disease even. Can we re-intervene? So I'm gonna go point by point. So the first step is, can the transfermal therapy be done? The answer is you have to look at the CT to detail the analysis. And you can see this patient has some annular and outflow trap calcification, try leave the valve. You wanna see where the calcium is located. You wanna see the root anatomy to make sure there's no coronary obstruction risk. And also you wanna look at access to make sure transfermal is feasible. Because remember, all the randomized trials are comparing transfemoral tower versus surgery, not alternative access. Paraviral leak is mild, okay? We don't know. You can see that in the paraviral leak data from partner three low risk patients, about almost two years, 26% of survivors still have mild paraviral leak in the TAVR arm. We don't know whether this will impact on the physiology and outcomes as we follow them longer term. But technology is improving. You can see Safe in Free Ultra, the percentage of mild PBL now is down to less than 10%. And in our experience, this is very similar observation, where it's really unheard of to a mild PVL with this platform. Now with the Evolute Pro Plus and now FX, you can also see that there is an improvement in parabolic leak, now 27, 6.6%. However, I think if you optimize the implant, at least in our experience, it's well less than 10%. Now conduction system is still an Achilles heel in TAVR. You can see that it ranges 15 to 75% into the left bundle branch block, depending which device you use. The major predictor, of course, is implant depth and also the septal length. And you can see some of our predictors here. And pacemaker is about 5 to 
uh, it is associated with mortality and impaired LV recovery and rehospitalization. And we know that right bundle branch block is the strongest independent predictor, but of course, implant depth can also be controlled to optimize the experience and the outcomes. So with left bundle branch block in the partner three, you can see that it's around 24%. And in the lowest chart, the permanent pacemaker rate is tablets 21%. So certainly we need to do better in reducing this complication. There are some techniques that we've done, such as the custom web technique that I first offered back in 2018. You can see that the rationale is that it allows you to have more symmetric deployment, more anatomically accurate deployment, and also you can plan higher with optimal depth rather than deeper and risking pacemaker. And so the advantage of this uh, cuss overlap view is it limits the parallax of the delivery catheter. It's more center, as I mentioned, you develop and deploy a true coplanar view, easier to visualize between the non cuss and the left cuss, and to also avoid pop-out. And here's why. You can see that with the cuss overlap view, the non coronary cuffs is sprayed open very nicely here. And so it's easy to delay the depth, rather than as you go to the LEO view, it's very wider, open, so it's harder to tell where the true nadir is. And there's some emerging data showing that it does make a difference in terms of pacemaker rate with the Apple platform. You can see that here, less than 10% if you do it correctly. In fact, the balloon expandable valve in Cleveland Clinic report a series that they do the aerial quarter view to take the parallax out of the sapien free valve in a similar manner, like the custom overlap view to optimize deployment and implant depth, you can see the difference in pacemaker rate in their series. Now, coronary access after tower it can be very challenging. And the reason being that the prevalence is quite high. You can see over 60% of even intermediate risk patient has CAD and depends on the device, their success can be variable. But more importantly, most interventional cardiologists are not familiar with tower or they don't do tower. So they don't know what these devices are like and the technical nuances that they require to access the coronary. The aortic root anatomy is also variable. And unlike surgery, there's a native aortic valve leap in the way, there's the transcaptor valve stand frame, and also potentially a commissural post facing the coronary because of lack of commissural alignment. So here are two examples why uh, tower, the coronary access might be difficult. You can see on the left side is a bulky leaflet facing the left main. On the right side is a low left vein after a surgical AVR, and then now you do a tower, you don't have a lot of room to go past the stent frame into the SDJ, into the root. So we now have a uh, paper that came out a few years ago, summarizing all the anatomical and device and procedural factors with coronary access after tower. And my colleague, Anna Bonacchini and Dr. Shami Sharma, and myself develop an app teaching people, interventional cardiologists who don't know much about TAVR, how to access the coronary, either uh, with the balloon expandable or self-expanding valve. And I encourage you to look at, go to this website and download the app for free on both Apple and Android platforms. So why may commercial alignment be important in TAVR? I think we don't just coronary access. That's reduce the coronary obstruction with TAVR and SAVR. That's increased our likelihood of redo TAVR by reducing the risk of sinus sequestration and coronary obstruction. There may now be potential benefit of alignment in terms of durability and reduced gradient. And finally, if you want to modify the leaflet, such as basilica or shortcut procedure, uh, you can't really do that if the commercial post faces the coronary. So here's a state-of-the-art review paper that we just recently published looking at some of the factors that commercial alignment may impact. It's not just coronary access or even redo tower. And you can see this paper from Rockford Cost Group at Cedar Sinai and Jack Intervention showing that there's a relative increase in gradient if you come and show misalignment with the balloon expandable valve. So you need to understand the anatomic relationship in terms of aortic root and the tower device. So shorter frames are probably more important in terms of redo tower. So these include balloon expandable valve or mechanically expandable valve. But in the taller frame valves, usually they're self expanding. They are relevant more, both in coronary access and redo tower. So this is a tutorial that I recently wrote showing that commercial element. I think it's important in both coronary access and redo tower in addition to other factors. So what is commercial alignment? Well, here in the picture you see on the left side that the transcaptor valve commissure is aligned with the native commissures, which is the right side you can see is exactly opposite. So what you see is that commissure post and you'll see next slide that is a very tall commercial post, a big triangle facing the coronary, 
And so you have to get around this commercial post to access the coronary. And this is what I meant. The blue shaded area represents a commercial post. You can see, unlike the surgical valve, where it's just a, a short stent frame that is pretty vertical, you see a big triangular scaffold here potentially impeding you from access to the coronary, as you see on the bottom right panel. And so, for example, with the envelope with suboptimal alignment, you can imagine you have to go for either side of this commercial post fluty cells in an oblique manner to access the coronary, which are depicted as red dots. Now, if you have optimal alignment on the right side, you can see it's much easier to get above the coronary to engage it. But even in high implant, you can potentially still do that, but more in an oblique angle. In fact, 10 to 20% of the patients who undergo TAVR end up having commissural posts. This is a CT study facing one of the coronaries, making coronary access potentially difficult. And with TAVR and SAVR, you can see that here, despite leaflet modification in both these examples at the bench top of the mitral flow valve, if you have commercial misalignment, you can also see the commercial post will be obstructing the split portion of the leaflet, causing coronary obstruction. So all your hard work end up going to waste. This paper we published a couple of years ago now on a line tower looking at three different transcaptor valves on their ability to orient. And you can see that with safe and free, unfortunately, there's no specific way to align the commissures. Now with safe X4, you do have that option with that letter C and you can actually rotate to the center part of the screen at the time of the deployment when you cross the annulus. And so you can try to optimize the commercial orientation that way. And so in the interest of time, I'll just show you how that's done. But with the Evolute platform, you can do just simply rotate the capital at three o'clock. And now with Evolute FX, over 90% of the time, you can get commercial alignment. How can you tell? You do it in the cuss overlap view. And when you release the valve, you can see that here in the bottom right, that you see that it's facing an inner curve with the paddle facing the right side of the screen. So you might have to rotate the valve on dry CNA floral to go in a more complainer view, but you can see the CTAP there if you just rotate this gently. In fact, the commercial alignment actually helped with coronary access, not just the Evolute valve, but also the accurate Neo2 valve, as shown here by just the Zappi Tarantini's group. You can now see that the selective angiography in the green bar goes much higher, and also in the overall, it's also 97%. You can engage the coronary. And with Evolute FX, the Numbers are even better. You can see that 100% the head marker will be in the cuss overlap view, 94%, so it's just based on roughly 50 cases of commercial alignment. But the issue, the, the big deal is that the coronary interference is much lower. It's only 4%, well, into single digits in terms of coronary interference, because basically that's what you really worry about at the end of the day. At the same time, you can see the implant depth with the Evolute FX is also improved. It does more symmetric, so better in terms of reducing pacemaker rate or left on the branch block. So the cuss overlap view and commercial alignment in Tavern does not apply just to Evolute valve. We also can help with echo Neo2 valve with different techniques and maybe portico valve as well. And you can see the pedals or, or pat, uh, commercial posts are located here for your reference. So the summary, I think coronary access after Tavern with commercial alignment, I think is critical. Uh, it can make the potential lifetime management easier uh, including redo tower, and there's technic technique modification and using custom overlap view to improve self expanding valve into the commercial alignment. Safe in three, you cannot do that, but certainly X4, you should. And you can see some of the tricks involved in terms of just rotating delivery cover at, with plus port at three o'clock for Evolute and six o'clock for accurate Neo2. And this is the summary of the paper that I encourage you to download at your own leisure. Now, finally, lifetime management of aortic valve disease. So how do you reintervene these patients? With SAVR, it's pretty easy. You do a tower and SAVR or maybe re-op surgery if the patient's a candidate. But there are a number of factors to consider, at least in the tower and SAVR space, where you need to look at the valve type, valve model, valve size, what's the mechanism of failure, what new transcaptor valves you put in, what are the dimensions, are you going to obstruct the coronary? Uh, how do you select one mouse or the other? Is it by hemodynamics? Is it by coronary access? And also any adjunctive procedure needed. Now, redo tower is very different. You can see that here, it's not just depending on those, but also more importantly, the anatomy. The STJ width has to be suitable so you don't cause sinus sequestration. The leaflet height is also important so you don't end up 
obstructing the coronary by sealing off the part of the aortic root. And finally, how deep your implant is. So a deeper implant may be more favorable, but of course you risk trading off with pacemakers and other sequelae. So this is the reason why sinus sequestration happens when we do TAVR. When you put in a second mouth, the leaflets of the first mouth becomes like a tube graft. So it depends on where that top of the leaflets end up, you might seal off the entire sinus tubular junction completely and end up potentially with coronary obstruction on both coronaries. And this is an angiographic study that we published a couple of years ago, looking at the aortic root classification. So if you type one root, plenty of space between the valve frame or the lead, top of the leaflet to the STJ and sinus height, then you should have no issue with coronary obstruction and redo tower should be fine. But if you have type two, you're gonna to have to measure this space here in terms of valve to sinus height or valve to sinus distance. And if you have type three root, you really have to make sure your STJ is adequate. Otherwise you're gonna seal off the entire root because the top of the leaflet goes above the sinus tubular junction. And in fact, with the MedStar low risk study, you can see that here that a percentage of the time, 13%, end up being not feasible for redo tower because of the above reasons. So one hypothesis is that if you're between sizing of two different mouths, why not implant a smaller mouth and overexpand it to make it more optimally expanded such that you may facilitate redo tower in the future? And this is a paper we show that is now published in, C in CCI so that if you optimize the frame expansion of the first valve, maybe perhaps undersize it because there's sometimes recoil of the larger valve, you can improve uh, redo tower feasibility even at the higher implant compared to let's say the bottom, you go for a larger valve and you now you have to seal off the aortic root. And you can see that here in terms of the extremely undersized group, the light blue, the redo tower feasibility is certainly better than if you were to upsize to the larger size balloon expandable valve as you saw in the dark blue bars. Now, in terms of common show alignment, in terms of redo tower, why is it important? Because not just for leaflet modification strategy, but remember, you can reduce the neo skirt height if you can modify the leaflet from, to, let's say, in, in the sapien down to a third of it, and then for the envelope platform, maybe even half. So this is very important to be able to maintain coronary flow and simplify the procedure, potentially. And if you have two transcaptor valves, the commercial orientation of the first versus second is very important. You can see that here on the top, on this, if you put a second valve in and it's gonna be a taller valve, make sure you have good commercial alignment because now you have two valves in the way. And with the first valve being a taller valve, you definitely want commercial alignment for that one because it will impact your ability to access the coronary and doing redo tower with leaflet modification potential in the, with the second valve. And that's what I mean by balloon assisted by silica, you basically open up the split portion of the leaflet better, and so it will recoil and delay closure. Now, finally, if you can't do redo tower, what are your options? So really, tower explant is really the only one, and it's not the same as first time of redo tower. Um, you remove the native leaflets and debulk the annular and LVOT calcium, so you have a clean tissue plane to sew the surgical valve in. But redo tower, uh, you know, or even redo tower rather, the, there is a plane between the surgical valve and the annulus. So there really are no other structures to take out or debride to extricate other than the surgical valve itself. And also the LBLT, mitral valve, H and aorta are not impacted by redo salver. Now, Taver X plan, though, there are three factors impacting surgical complexity. There's anatomic uh, factors in terms of native aortic valve leaflet stuck to the uh, transcaptor valve frame, so it's difficult to extricate. Uh, the, Transcaptor valve may be stuck to the annulus or LVOT or even the aorta. So you can't really define a tissue plane, higher risk of cardiac structure injury nearby, and so more extensive surgery or repair uh, increases the risk of the operation. With self expanding valve, you have to now cannulate higher in the aorta, cross come higher, you need to do a higher air autonomy. So this all can potentially add to the procedural complexity and patient risk. Finally, in terms of procedural, if you implant the valve deep, you can impact the Membrane septum, you can cause a VSD. You can damage the leaflet of the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve, become dysfunctional. So you don't just do a TAV or explant. You actually have to do VSD repair, mitral valve repair replacement. And so it's not just isolated procedures anymore. So these are some of the pictures that are published looking at TAV or explant. You can see this is a balloon expandable valve that's not explanted. And you can see that it can injure the aorta or the commissural post. 
and you can see that here as well. But uh, Evolut Bao that explained that you can see that endothelialization and healing with the aortic wall tissue in terms of trying to take out may not be that uh, easy. And of course, as I mentioned before, you can injure the aortic root, membrane septum, and tear mitral leaflet, or you can injure the aorta requiring reconstruction or replacement. So you can see that uh, this is a paper that we published last year looking at those explant tower experience across the world. This is a truly global international registry. You can see that the balloon expandable to self expanding valve roughly half and half, uh, a little bit less than a year into the median time explant. Most of them had aortic valve replacement, but a small percentage of root replacement and they were similar in outcomes. But you can see the stroke rate and the mortality rate are quite sobering. You can see one year mortality rate is almost 30% and stroke is almost 20%. And so what we've looked at also is what if you compare the same group of centers doing TAVR explant and to see how many of them actually also can redo TAVR when the valve fails, because you want to understand how the decision making is between the heart in the, within the heart team on, should I do redo TAVR or do I need to take the patient to the operating room? So what we presented in TVT this year was that five and pa uh, three patients across 29 centers Underwent either redo TAVR or TAVR explant for transcaptor valve failure. Now, these are not valve failures during the initial procedure. So it's not like the valve embolized and you do another valve or you do TAVR explant. We did not count those because those would not be the same category as patients who later on have valve failure needing lifetime management. And you can see that also we exclude that 45% of patients that have endopathitis because clearly you're not going to be able to uh, safely do a redo TAVR in a patient with endocarditis. So what we essentially have done uh, is to look at half and half of the patients now left uh, on redo tower and explant. And actually the overall the, uh, incidence of patient needing re-intervention after tower was quite low, it's only half a percent. And these are the centers that participated in our study. And you can see that here compared to redo tower, the tower explant clearly uh, are younger, but also have a higher heart team derived surgical risk. You can see that here. Uh, most of the redo tower patients are older and sicker, but are less so for the explant because obviously they are operative candidates. And you can see that here in terms of what valves are being uh, taken out, you can see that here, there are more safe and free undergoing tower explant than the previous generation valve. And of course, there are more supraannular self-expanding valves such as call on Evolute being done and compared to other transcaptor valve devices. Now, in terms of the mechanism of failure, structural de valve deterioration uh, is particularly prevalent in the redo tower group. However, post-thesis patient mismatch, you can see that here is much higher in the tower explant group because really, once you have severe mismatch, it's very hard to get expand the valve further to avoid that. And so really the only option is to take that valve out and do a root enlargement to put a larger surgical valve in there. And interestingly, for tower explant, the interval is quite a bit shorter uh, unlike redo tower, which are probably likely, as you saw earlier, fail because of structural valve deterioration or paravalve leak. But as you know, severe mismatch or maybe even paravalve leak that is significant don't, are not tolerated well in these patients. So they, that's why probably likely they intervene sooner through surgery rather than redo the tower. In terms of the tower type that you put in, as a second mark, you can see most of them obviously are the current generation valve, safe and free, and the evolute. Uh, you can see also the surgical valve, majority of a tissue valve, the small percentage of root replacements I mentioned before, longer cross time and pump time, obviously. But they're also important to note that there are a number of other concomitant cardiac surgical procedures being done at the time of explant, such as cabbage, a sudden aortic replacement, or valves, other valve surgery. And if you look at the differences between THV1 versus THV2 uh, being implanted, you can see there's really no difference or preference between one type of valve versus another. Now in terms of in-hospital outcomes, you can see that the coronary obstruction risk is zero actually. So that goes to tell you that the uh, patient selection is quite important here. And there's also uh, no uh, only free conversions to surgery in the redo tablet group. Obviously the uh, vascular complication is higher in the redo tablet group, uh, but obviously also there is a 
higher pacemaker rate, interestingly, was the top expired because of the injury to the membrane septum that will likely need reconstruction. And of course, top explant require longer stay. Now you can see that interestingly, uh, on the left panel, if you look at the fatality, clearly top explant is higher because it's a surgery versus pre to tabber. But interestingly, the stroke rate is no difference. And you can see at one year, this stroke rate of eight to 9% in each group. So clearly, even though you can survive more, stroke rate is still a concern. And you can see numerically, maybe even higher in the redo tablet group. Now, as I mentioned before, the tablet expand did have a higher mortality over the follow-up, you can see five years. But once you censor them at the landmark analysis at 30 days, they essentially are completely overlap to each other, no difference. So if you had surgery and you make it beyond 30 days, you likely have a similar survival than someone having redo tablet. And we looked at also the, between balloon expandable versus non-balloon expandable, valve. there's really no difference across uh, over time in terms of the two treatment arms. And so you can see this is a summary of our paper uh, being under uh, submitted for consideration for publication. So in summary, I think the experimental redo tower registry is the first study that really compare, even though apples to oranges, between redo tower and tower explant across the same centers. And the median time to tower intervention is shorter in tower explant and redo tower had more structural valve degeneration. Uh, there were similar rates of failure between balloon and self and non-balloon expandable valve, and also in terms of preference of usage of the second valve. Tower expand certainly have high mortality, but really no difference in stroke and no difference between balloon versus non-balloon expandable valve. So I think what we need to look at is that, you know, the timing of reintervention earlier, tower explant instead of selection bias. Uh, the TV THV type did not influence outcomes. But I think also from a tower explant standpoint, the surgeons, we're now putting together to try to make these procedures more reproducible and safer so that more surgeons can do this safely. Now, if you cannot do tower explant, there's a bailout strategy that my colleague has published. Basically, you can just go in, uh, it's still cardiac surgery, and you do have to stop the heart and open up the aorta, but you can actually just remove the leaflets quickly and then implant a transcapital inside. Basically, the first valve serves as a scaffold or stand frame for the second valve. So you can potentially reduce the cross time and pump time and get the patient out of the operating room, especially if they're very sick. So I think the summary on tablet explant, as I mentioned before, uh, is a technically more challenging operation than first time or even redo salver. But I think with experience, it will improve. And I do think that we need to discuss with patients that if you look at the CAT scan and you cannot do redo tablet because of the anatomy, you need to talk about potential lifetime management with the patient, either should they go do surgery first or tower first. Now, the bottom line is that it depends on a patient's life expectancy. So you can see that here, if you're 65, you're likely to live 20 years old. If you are 70s, you're likely to live 10, and by the time you turn 80, you're really five. And that's if you don't have aortic valve disease. So once you have aortic valve disease, this is even probably shorter. So you have to ask yourself, if you're younger, how do you get these patients to the mid 80s? And you can see this nice review from your uh, European Heart Journal saying that depends on the age, it depends on what you start with. There are certainly some other factors in considering whether they will be appropriate because more likely in a younger group, at least you'll have one reintervention, maybe two. So if you're 65 plus, you can see you most likely need one more reintervention. So the question is which is easier, which is safer for this patient, and which has better outcomes. Now, just quickly talk about bicuspid valve because there's a lot of bicuspid valve in Asia. Uh, you can see SAVR is favor, typically in younger patients, suboptimal anatomy for TAVR, and aortopathy requiring concomitant surgery. Of course, if you have higher extreme surgical risk and your favor anatomy, I think TAVR is reasonable in bicuspid valve, but we don't have longer term data, and there are, but there are some early experience and one year outcomes published in registry. And you can see that here, even for bicuspid valve, TAVR has overcome. Uh, surgery in 2016, and but most of these patients granted are sicker with more comorbidities. And if you look at the ACC Asia guidelines, though, you do see that uh, SAVR is favored in bicuspid aortic mouth anatomy. And you can see that the reason being that over 50 shades of bicuspid valve, as you shown in these CT reconstructions here, they all look different, so they require a tailored approach to these patients, but also at the same time, the issues involve supraannular versus annular sizing. There's more likely risk of PBL or root injury. 
uh, because the rafe, you may constrain the valve or lead to root injury and maybe impacting on durability because of the valve may be underexpanded, as shown now in the recent circulation paper, uh, but also higher stroke uh, and also pacemaker uh, and peripheral leak. So you can see that here with the uh, self-expanding valve, the, the not bicuspid certainly have numerically higher rates of mild parabolic leak. And you can see that's the paper I was part of in JAM looking at the safety and free valve in bicuspid uh, in the TBT registry. They do a more stroke at 30 days, new pacemaker uh, at, at one year. Other data showing balloon versus self-expanding valve, essentially you can see that summary that the uh, balloon expandable valve have higher risk of rupture and self-expanding valve have higher risk of paraviral leak. And you can see that this is the low risk patients now looking at bicuspid tower. This is the group from the low risk, uh, MedStar low risk trial. And you can see that here with the self-expanding valve, they do all right at early 30 days, but we don't have longer term data yet. However, you can see that parabolic leak rate is still quite prevalent, even for mild. And this is a paper from Raj Vikas, uh group looking at the calcification of the RAFE and leaflet in terms of outcomes after bicuspid tower. And you can see that here, that when you have severe leaflet calcification and the calcified RAFE, your mortality at two years is higher. And also your parabolic uh, leak rate is also higher. So what do we do about these younger patients with aortic stenosis? So I think there are three options, mechanical valve, prosthetic tissue valve with either cellular tower and the Ross procedure. Now the Ross procedure has really made a comeback recently. You can see there was a state of the art review a couple of years ago. If you don't know what it is, it's basically putting the pulmonary valve and the root and replace it into the aortic root. And so you reconstruct that and then you put a homograph typically on the pulmonary position. So you now have a biological valve in the aortic position. And you can see now multiple studies have confirmed that uh, it is better than any kind of prosthesis, whether it's mechanical or biological, because you reduce rate of reoperation and myocarditis, and you have reduced stroke rate or bleeding rate versus mechanical valve. And so this is potentially, in expert hands, a very suitable and appropriate option in younger patients with aortic stenosis. And you can see that here, consistently, the stroke bleeding oper reoperation can occur a lower with the Ross procedure. So I think in summary, TAVR is indicated in all surgical risk category in AS, but lifetime management strategy, I think is really key now. And the high risk anatomy patients, I think in low intermediate risk should still have surgery as an alternative. I mean, surgery should be default in younger patient with low risk by cuspid anatomy, with hostile anatomy. If I have the Ross procedure in, in expert hands, I think can restore life expectancy in younger patients with aortic stenosis. So I'd like to thank you very much for your attention.